The last remnants of an ice age cling to the poles of our planet. An ice age that's been receding for the last 11,000 years. Stepping foot here is like stepping back in time. To a world covered in ice, whipping winds, and harsh, unsettling cold. But on this wind-whipped ice stands a stoic creature. A creature who does not survive despite the ice, but depends on it. Hailed by many as the Lords of Antarctica, Emperor penguins can reach heights of up to 1.3 meters or 4.3 feet and weigh up to 100 pounds or 45 kilograms, making them the largest penguin species. But these massive birds earn their name not for their size, but for their physical characteristics and abilities that make them seem as though they were designed to truly rule the Antarctic. And even though their imagery pervades the media, compared to all other birds and even to other penguins, emperor penguins are downright strange creatures. No other animal can survive the cold like they can. No other animal is so wonderfully and bizarrely adapted to life on the ice, but also life in the sea. The emperor penguin is considered the deepest diving bird in the world, reaching depths far beyond 500 meters and capable of staying under frigid waters for up to 30 minutes at a time. Their feathers not only streamline their swimming, but can also be actively manipulated to create an air injection, providing a hydrodynamic boost we normally only see in high-tech ships and underwater missiles. And to keep warm during their life in the frigid sea and windy sheets of ice, they've evolved a unique composition of feathers that don't just retain their body heat, but actively draw in heat from an environment that seems like it doesn't have any. They also utilize sea ice as a breeding ground, and if this wasn't impressive enough, they choose to use the ice to breed in the harsh Antarctic winter, where temperatures can reach 50 degrees Celsius below freezing, the coldest breeding temperature any known bird can tolerate. And despite all these incredible adaptations, we humans were certain for a long time that emperor penguins were the lowest form of bird an evolutionary straggler inferior to the rest. But this could not be farther from the truth. And though their incredible adaptations have allowed emperor penguins to conquer the Antarctic, a rapidly changing global climate threatens their reign and might turn their evolutionary advantage into a liability. To understand what the future may hold for these incredible birds, it's important to ask, how did they come to rule such a frigid region? And where do they sit on the evolutionary tree? How are emperor penguins built to survive the sea and the ice? And how do they behave to not only survive, but to thrive in such an extreme environment? Well before people associated penguins with acute stature and comical waddling, Emperor penguins were widely regarded by scientists as the key to unlocking the secrets of evolutionary theory. In the early 20th century, the relatively fresh new theory of evolution fascinated the scientific world and inspired many to study animal life and how it developed. From this surge of curiosity, scientists noticed that many animals also appeared to have very similar looking embryonic stages early in their development. From this curious observation, biologist Ernst Haeckel proposed recapitulation theory as a hypothesis for understanding the evolutionary history of certain organisms. The theory suggested that the embryos of more advanced life forms, like human embryos, would always pass through stages that looked like their evolutionary ancestors, that they would go through phases of being a fish, amphibian, reptile, bird, etc until finally turning into a human, a recap of the wider scale evolutionary process. So why did they believe penguins, in particular, were the key to unlocking the secrets of evolution? Because at the time, penguins were considered to be the most primitive bird in existence, a bird that never evolved the ability to fly. Scientists thought that if they could decipher the embryology of this most primitive of birds, they could more clearly see how avian organisms evolved from their reptilian ancestors. We now know that this is not how it works, like, at all, but at the time they were quite convinced and went to the ends of the earth, literally, to try to prove it. 
In 1910, a grand expedition began, and a handful of explorers set out to retrieve emperor penguin eggs for science. This would be no small feat. To catch an emperor penguin egg would mean to brave the frigid and rough terrain of the Antarctic in the winter when it is often pitch black. The voyage would later be referred to by the explorers as the worst journey in the world, and with good reason. At the time, the expedition was considered to be the longest period at which humans were exposed to extreme climate conditions. What might have made the journey even worse, however, was the fact that its main objective, the penguin eggs, turned out to not be so useful. Recapitulation theory began to be discredited right around the time of the expedition, as scientists began to observe more varied embryologic development patterns that didn't quite align with Haeckel's theory. And even if the recapitulation theory were true, we now know that penguins are far from the most primitive birds in existence. The flightlessness of penguins, which was initially thought to be an ancestral trait after having freshly evolved from reptiles, is actually a secondary evolved trait. The ancestor of penguins would have been a flying bird, similar to a puffin or a cormorant. But over time, the penguin's ancestor got better at swimming and worse at flying. And then, around 60 million years ago, the penguin clade split off, losing their ability to fly entirely, and gaining what researchers refer to as a hyper-specialized marine body plan. The transition from having a body built for flying to one hyper-specialized to survive in a marine environment is one of the greatest evolutionary transitions of all time, up there with when tetrapods first stepped foot on land, or when the ancestors of whales took their steps back into the sea. But how could it possibly be advantageous to give up the ability to fly? Surely emperor penguins could rule the Antarctic if they could swim and fly, soaring through its skies instead of waddling around on slippery ice sheets. But unfortunately in the animal kingdom, everything is a trade-off. And as wings become more efficient for flying, they become less efficient for swimming, and vice versa. To understand this, it's helpful to think about why emperor penguins are considered the best diving birds in the world. Unlike their flying counterparts, they have a reduced wingspan, have greater weight and larger bones, and even at a molecular level, have muscle contraction rates that are optimized for low wing beat frequencies. All adaptations that make flight impossible. The adaptations necessary for flight simply go against the adaptations necessary for swimming. And when it comes to swimming, no other animal does it quite like the emperor penguin. The body shape of an emperor penguin lends itself to maneuvering beneath the ice, and while it might not always look like it, emperor penguins are among the most elite swimmers on the planet. But there is so much more to their underwater story than their big-boned, streamlined body. There are some unexpected ways in which they maximize their swimming efficiency, things we thought were reserved for our high-tech ships and submarines. One of these adaptations was discovered when marine ecology researchers looking at footage of emperor penguins ascending noted that the birds were always followed by fine bubbles that seemed to emerge from their feathers, in much the same way that an underwater missile would leave a trail of bubbles in its wake. And with some torpedoes, these bubbles are no accident. In the 1960s, engineers discovered that in theory, Drag could be reduced on underwater vessels if microbubbles were injected on their surfaces, covering them in a thin film of air. Soon after, the Russian Navy figured out how to turn this theoretical idea into reality. They developed a rocket-powered torpedo that could pump gas through a porous skin that covered the torpedo. It was capable of traveling underwater at up to 100 meters per second, more than twice as fast as conventional torpedoes. A torpedo has to overcome two types of drag. The first is related to the weapon's shape, and the second is related to the way that water clings to the surface of the object and is drawn along with it, slowing the object down. But if the torpedo is enveloped in a layer of gas, there will be no direct contact between the object and the water. A layer of gas just a fraction of a millimeter thick can reduce skin friction by up to 40%. Could the bubbles observed on the penguins' bodies be doing the same thing? 
scientists observed that before emperor penguins jump from the ice and plunge into the water, they first fluff up their feathers, trapping air in their plumage. Then once the penguin decides it's time to come up to breathe, it will release this trapped air from their body, forming a layer of fine bubbles that allows them to shoot back up to the surface. In footage of penguins ascending, it's easy to see the bubble trails. And if you pause the footage, you can even see the bubble clouds that envelop most of the body and obscure the tail and hind limbs. Scientists also note that no air is coming from the beak or nares. It emerges from the plumage. And the boost they seem to get from this is significant. Penguins descend and swim horizontally at around 2 meters per second. But they ascend with these bubbles at up to 6 meters per second. And this is critical because they need sufficient speed to overcome gravity as they leap out of the water and onto the sea ice. From this observation, researchers proposed that emperor penguins are likely employing what they describe as drag reduction by air release, or more simply, air lubrication, just like humans use on ships and torpedoes. And apart from this lubrication, this bubble coat might also offer other advantages. For example, it's well known that air lubrication can reduce the acoustic signals of ships, and the same might be true for emperor penguins and their echolocating predators. But as impressive as this is, emperor penguins aren't just adept at their heroic ascents. They are also the deepest diving birds in the world. This great feat has its advantages for the penguins beyond just asserting their reign as emperor. As the only birds capable of reaching such depths, they are virtually unchallenged in their claim over the abundant, nutrient-dense, and relatively easy-to-catch prey like the Atlantic silverfish that tends to inhabit these benthic regions. These dives can last almost 30 minutes. To manage these sustained deep dives, emperor penguins are equipped with physiological and cellular adaptations that help them maximize oxygen use. Like many air-breathing divers, the emperor penguin diving reflex involves a massive reduction in their heart rate that allows many organs, including the heart itself, to use up less oxygen. One study that attached electrodes to penguins during diving revealed that for extremely deep dives, heart rates can reach as low as 3 beats per minute. To complement this diving reflex, emperor penguins also employ peripheral vasoconstriction, here the birds are able to narrow blood vessels to such a point that they can effectively cut off certain muscles from their overall blood circulation. This allows the blood and the oxygen it carries to be distributed to more important muscle groups and organs, like to the brain and the heart. On a molecular level, the emperor penguin is also exceptional at storing large amounts of oxygen relative to its size. For example, myoglobin, a protein that stores and supplies skeletal muscles with oxygen, is considerably elevated in some muscles of emperor penguins, especially their pectoral muscles. On the other hand, hemoglobin, the protein mostly found in the blood and responsible for distributing oxygen to the different parts of the body, has a considerably higher affinity for oxygen in the emperor penguin compared to other birds. This allows the blood to better take up whatever oxygen is still present in the lungs during hypoxic conditions, and better distribute this oxygen to different parts of the penguin's body. But as incredible as this all is, an emperor penguin's ability to dive deep in Antarctic waters is only as useful as their ability to keep warm. Water temperatures in the Antarctic hover below freezing, at negative 1.8 degrees Celsius. It stays liquid only due to its high salt content. Air temperatures can reach negative 40 or 50 degrees Celsius, and winds often whip at speeds as high as 144 kilometers per hour. How any living creature can survive here is almost beyond comprehension. And yet, the emperor penguin thrives here and their adaptations to do so are some of the most fascinating in the animal kingdom. They owe 80 to 90% of their thermoregulation to the insulation provided by their unique composition of feathers. To better appreciate this, it's important to understand the difference between the four types of feathers. The contour feather, the phyllo plume, the after feather, and the plumule. 
contour feathers are long, stiff feathers that, as their name suggests, provide a specific contour to the outer surface of the bird's body. These feathers encase the body, keeping icy water out and protecting the insulating layers below. Phyloplumes are almost microscopic feathers that are likely used to sense the arrangement of the contour feathers, allowing the penguins to adjust the contour feathers as needed to create a more hydrodynamic shape in the water. And then there are the after feathers and plumules. These are the soft, downy feathers that make up the insulation component of the plumage. After feathers are attached to contour feathers, and plumules are attached directly to the skin. As you might have guessed, emperor penguins have a considerably greater density of plumules compared to contour feathers, with a recent study showing up to a four-fold greater density of plumules compared to contour feathers. These fine feathers form a dense mat of insulation that keeps emperor penguins warm. And this insulation remains intact and dry, even as penguins continue their deep dives. The high density of these plumules also provides support for the air lubrication hypothesis mentioned earlier, as these fine feathers would produce the fine bubble streams previously described. Beyond just extreme insulation to keep heat from being drawn out into the environment, the plumage of emperor penguins seems to grant them the seemingly impossible ability to draw in heat from a bitterly cold environment. When scientists pointed cameras at an emperor penguin colony, they discovered something almost paradoxical. Most of the outer surface of the emperor penguin's plumage was actually colder than the surrounding Antarctic air. This can happen when the sky is clear and excess heat is lost from the outer surface of the body due to radiative cooling. And because hot air naturally flows towards areas of cooler temperatures, emperor penguins can suck in heat via convection, almost commanding the heat and the surrounding air towards themselves. The penguins manage to do this without actually feeling the colder-than-air plumage, because the plumage itself is a very poor thermal conductor, preventing any outward heat transfer from the warmer, inner surfaces of the penguin. To add an extra layer of warmth, emperor penguins also engage in what researchers call social thermoregulation, which basically means that they huddle together in groups to share and conserve body heat. This isn't just a random aggregation of cuddling, though. Research has shown that this huddling behavior is a dynamic, organized network sensitive to environmental changes such as air temperature, wind speeds, and available sunlight. In general, there appears to be a system of more loosely aggregated penguins feeding smaller huddles that appear to be in greater need of warmth. By now, it's clear that the emperor penguins have all the biological tools to tolerate the challenges of a harsh, freezing climate. However, as we've said, they don't just tolerate these unforgiving icy conditions. They prefer it. This is probably best seen in their preference to breed during the Antarctic winter. Emperor penguins begin their breeding cycles when most other Antarctic birds have already finished theirs. An emperor penguin's breeding cycle begins around April, when Antarctic sea ice reforms and becomes thick enough to support a breeding colony. At the beginning of the cycle, emperor penguins of the same colony return to the same location they bred last year. Once all huddled together, the males engage in an elaborate courtship ritual that involves a mix of head bobbing, swinging, and waddling, with males sometimes even competing for a mate. When everyone is partnered up, emperor penguin pairs get busy and each produce only a single egg. Since the vast, frigid expanse of the Antarctic isn't exactly the best place to set up a nest, and there are no bushes or branches, the females hand over the egg to their male partners, who are tasked with incubating the eggs on their feet under a loose fold of featherless skin called the brood patch. And because the eggs must be kept warm at all times, the males do so for an astounding four months straight, without any food at all, relying only on their body fat until the chicks hatch around July. It's been speculated by some researchers that this unusual arrangement is brought about by the fact that each pair of emperor penguins has only one extremely valuable egg. To ensure that this single hope for an offspring survives, it's important that the egg receives round-the-clock protection, and during an extreme winter period when predators such as leopard seals and seabirds are not around. Then, once the egg hatches, both penguins raise the chick into a fledgling until December. 
All these adaptations bring us back to the big picture, that emperor penguins require sea ice throughout their life cycle, be it as a stable gathering place for breeding and raising chicks, or as platforms for diving and exploring the Antarctic seas. As it stands today, however, the once unquestioned reign of the Lords of Antarctica appears to be, quite literally, running on thin ice. In 2022, satellite imaging used to monitor emperor penguin colonies showed a catastrophic breeding failure due to the lowest sea ice ever recorded in Antarctica that year. These dots show the locations of the five emperor penguin colonies in this one highly affected region. Remember that the complete breeding cycle of emperor penguins requires that sea ice remain solid for a prolonged period of time. If this ice melts prematurely as it did in 2022, parent penguins may be forced to leave their premature chicks, who have yet to fully mature enough to come along with their parents to more stable ice. While some emperor penguin colonies have been documented to move towards more stable ice shelves that are nearer to land, this may only be a temporary solution, if at all, to a rapidly changing climate that makes it difficult for emperor penguins to continue their icy way of life. Because of these unique circumstances, the emperor penguin has become an emblematic species in representing how climate change is rapidly affecting Antarctic ecosystems. As the narrative of the current climate crisis unfolds, there is something to be said about how a bird we once thought would provide us with all the secrets of evolution is receiving interest once more, this time as an example of the effects of our rapidly warming climate. But beyond being symbols of the climate crisis, something about these waddling birds just seems to resonate with so many people. Maybe we see ourselves in them just a bit. Upright, clumsy, kinda chubby, social creatures who just wanna hang out and cuddle, I know I relate to a lot of these. But there's one thing in particular about penguins that I deeply relate to, their need for a truly ridiculous number of naps. Emperor penguins take hundreds of naps throughout the day and night for just a few minutes at a time wherever they happen to be standing. Chinstrap penguins take literally 10,000 naps per day. Penguins do this to make sure they stay alert enough to run away from predators if they need to. Humans do this because they never really get enough sleep because staring into a rectangle that contains all the world's information is more appealing than laying in a dark room with all our own thoughts. Whatever the reason for them, a million naps a day for penguins is not really a problem. For me, it kind of is. I unfortunately got stuff to do. I gotta teach you guys about penguins and bugs and stuff. So to stay awake, I do the most human thing there is, drink lots and lots of coffee. But also as a human, I firmly believe I deserve lots of little treats. These treats often mean going out and getting myself an $8 latte. Don't get me wrong, I love this for me, but $8 a day gets to be a bit much. So instead, I sometimes make myself coffee at home, but the beans from the grocery store that I have stocked up in my cabinet are just not that great. They are questionably sourced, questionably roasted, and questionably aged, thus pushing me towards more $8 lattes. But now there's a new solution thanks to this video's sponsor, Trade Coffee. Trade is a subscription that delivers fresh bags of coffee from over 55 of the country's top indie roasters right to your door. And it's the best way to help you do more in 2024. You need trade if you want to hit the ground running with your New Year's goals, goals such as not taking so many naps and getting through your to-do list every day. And I absolutely love trade because it helps me to make better coffee at home. I no longer need to go out for little treats. I can have them much more cheaply and easily at home. And the best part is trade lets you experience coffee that is curated just for you. For example, I don't like dark roasts, but I love light roasts. And I always want my coffee to be whole bean, so it stays fresher longer. But Trade goes even deeper than this. Trade maps your specific preferences to hundreds of different coffee flavor profiles. Their technology pairs you with the best coffees using art and science, marrying industry expertise and machine learning. It's been so fun getting new recommendations and trying new coffees that I never would have been able to get before. They even have one from a roaster called Mother Tongue called the Nebula Roast. Of course I had to try that one. Plus, Trade roasts your coffee to order and delivers it exactly when you need it. It's so easy to schedule an order. So upgrade your morning routine with better coffee. 
Right now, Trade is offering Real Science viewers a free bag of coffee with any subscription at drinktrade.com slash real science. That's drinktrade.com slash real science for a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase. Plus, you'll be supporting the channel by signing up with that link. So click the button on the screen or the link in the description to sign up today.